Did you know that 12% of all the internet traffic in the world goes to Netflix? That is millions of requests per second. It's insane. 안녕하십니까? Nicolas and today we're going to talk about the backend of Netflix. How do they handle millions of requests per second? How can they scale their service so much? And especially, how can they deliver HD video everywhere in the world? The backend of Netflix was first made using Java and Oracle databases. It was also hosted on their own data centers. Having your own data center means that you don't rent anybody's server. Instead, you buy all the hardware and you maintain your servers on your own. The problem with this Java plus Oracle own data center architecture is that it was very monolithic. Monolithic architecture is almost the default architecture that everybody follows, where you have a single backend application doing everything. This means that in the case of Netflix, they had a Java application that was in charge of the user registration, the payments, the homepage, the search bar, everything. If that sounds like a normal backend to you, it's because it is. Making monoliths is a very standard practice. If you build anything using Django, Ruby on Rails, Node.js, Java Spring, chances are that you build a monolith. Now the problem with monoliths is that, as you can imagine, because everything is on one place, if that server goes down, if that application crashes, it will take everything down with it. So that means that if there is a problem with the video streaming, for example, and it crashes the server for some reason, the payments will go down, the user registration will go down, everything will go down because everything again is together. Also, if you are working on a team and different people are changing different parts of the code at different points in time, sometimes it could be hard to deploy that code to production because you have to basically restart your whole application. Another problem with a monolithic architecture is that you can only scale your server vertically. Scaling vertically or scaling up basically means purchasing more hardware to make your server more powerful. So you still have one server doing everything, but now you give it more memory, more storage, more gigabytes, more power. Now the problem with this approach is that it's not elastic. This means that, for example, if you have a peak in traffic, you maybe won't have the resources to respond to those users. And also, if you buy a lot of memory and maybe your users go down, that memory will be wasted because you don't need it anymore. So this is when Netflix changed from a monolithic architecture to a microservices architecture. A microservice architecture is the opposite of a monolithic architecture, where all the logic of your application is divided in tiny independent services that talk to each other, but are not depending on one another. Now, these services can be running on different servers. They can be running on different programming languages. And the cool thing is that if one service falls, the other ones are not gonna go down with him. For example, one microservice could be in charge of email verification. Another one maybe is gonna handle payments only, and another one will handle the search bar. Now again, if for some reason the search microservice crashes, there is no reason why the payment or the user microservice will crash. Also, the beauty of having a microservice architecture is that you can create a microservice on anything you want. You can have one team building a microservice in Go and another team building a microservice in Node.js. So it's also really cool on a big organization with a lot of developers and a lot of code. This is how the Netflix backend looks like, running on a microservice architecture. It's still complex and it's big, but it's also easier to maintain and it's easy to scale. Microservices allow horizontal scaling. This means that instead of buying more power for one machine, like vertical scaling, what you do instead is you create many tiny machines. When using microservices, if there are a lot of users searching for movies, for example, and one instance of the search microservice is not enough, what you can do is you can just create many instances of the search microservice. As you can see, with a monolithic architecture, you have to scale the whole application. This means you just make a more powerful server. With microservices, you can scale the parts of your application that get hotter when more people come. Keep in mind that while this microservice architecture might sound beautiful, scalable and sexy for our nerd brains, it's not as easy to implement as you think. There is a lot of infrastructure needed to run these microservices to allow them to talk to each other and to scale up or scale down depending on traffic. 
This is why Netflix decided that they couldn't be running and maintaining their own servers and instead they moved to AWS. It took them more than five years to move completely from their own data centers to the Amazon cloud. Now, before we keep going, I know what you might be thinking. Monolith sucks, microservices are awesome. Yes, maybe. But now what I've seen across the industry is that most companies usually start as a monolithic architecture and only when they need to scale some parts horizontally or maybe when they're becoming too big to manage or maybe when deployment is very hard to do, then they consider going to a microservice architecture. Keep in mind that you could actually get really far using a monolithic architecture. Billion dollar websites like Stack Overflow, for example, serving millions of views every day are a monolith. In the case of Stack Overflow, a C -sharp .net monolith. So now that we know the backend, let's focus on, in my opinion, the coolest part of Netflix, and that is how they handle this video streaming. Since millions of people use Netflix, of course they have to be smart about how they deliver their video as fast as possible and with the highest quality possible to as many different devices as possible. They can't use a single server putting all the movies and series there because as we know, if that server goes down, then nobody can watch movies. And also, depending on where the server is, the movies will load faster or slower. To fix this problem, Netflix used to use CDNs to deliver their video content. A CDN is basically a company that has a lot of servers all around the world. And if you pay them, they're going to take your files and they're going to copy them and they're going to put them in all their locations. So when a user requests a video file, the server closest to them is going to answer them. Now, because it's very hard to optimize somebody else's server and because Netflix is so incredibly big, they created their own solution called Netflix Open Connect. Netflix Open Connect is a system where Netflix takes this little red box, loads it with up to 360 terabytes of movies and series and gives it to your internet provider. So if you are here in South Korea and you want to watch Kingdom, that video file is not going to come from the US server of Netflix. Instead, it might come right from the data centers of your internet company. This is also why if you use a VPN, you might be able to watch content that is not available in your region. When using a VPN, you are basically going to another ISP or internet service provider. And so you are using another little red box parked in a different country. The cool thing is that these little red boxes call home to receive updates. So if there is a new series or there is a new movie, the Netflix HQ in the US is going to push this file to all the little red boxes around the world in an off-peak time, for example, Monday morning. These little red boxes are going to be updated and ready to show you what you want to see. So to recap, the Netflix backend is divided in two. The video backend is made using Netflix Open Connect, which are these little red boxes that we talked about. And for everything else that is not related to video, they have hundreds of microservices talking to each other hosted on AWS. And that's it for this video. I absolutely love this systems design topic. So let me know if you like it as well. And I will try my best to make more videos talking about the backend of other companies and how they work and their challenges. Now, before I go, I just want to let you know that I have a new clone coding book. It's a clone coding Twitter. So go and check it out. It's made with Firebase, React JS. We're going to build our own sexy, tiny Twitter clone. So go and check it out. It's everywhere where you buy your books. Thank you so much, as always, for your support. I hope that you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to be happy. Don't forget to eat kimchi. Bye-bye.